Hey, y'all. Welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window at the Theater. I'm here today with my co-host, Landon. As usual, say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. (laughs) All right, you guys. So I think um, we've done some things that will hopefully solve the audio issue, so we shouldn't run into that this time. But if you hear Twitch doing the weird audio, please say something in the chat so that I know we haven't fixed it yet and I need to do more fiddling before next stream. Um, Because as you know, I do not hear the problem. It seems to happen most commonly live on Twitch. So yeah, just let me know. And hi, Jane. Welcome in. You're a rare first from Jane. My gosh, friend. I'm so happy you're here to talk about um, Sailor Moon Crystal Season (laughs) 2. So yeah, Landon, if you could do um, our little introduction, what what all are we talking about today? Like, explain it. We're talking about the original, the best, the magical girls, the Sailor Moon universe, but we're talking about the remakes. Crystal Mm -hmm. season two, the animation sucked season one, has it improved? We're going to talk about some themes. We're going to talk about some subconscional uh, messaging that might exist there. And overall, we're just going to have a good time because it's Sailor Moon. Uh, Everything's great in that world, unless, of course, you're being captured by sexy villains. But, you know, that happens sometimes. I mean, you know, if if we're talking fictional, it it could be worse. It could be worse. Um, They could be unsexy villains. So this is probably the section of Sailor Moon that you remember being the most annoyed with, hating as a child, most likely if you were like most of us. Um, But actually rewatching as an adult, I have a totally different outlook on this season. So I'm really excited to talk about it with you guys. Yes, I was talking about, I was talking to Karen about this. I think I just must have missed this, like a part of this season as it aired on Cartoon Network and Tsunami, uh, because there's an entire arc that I have no recollection of as a kid. As an adult, yes, but as a kid, I'm just like, did this actually exist in the originals? And it does. Yes. So Mm -hmm. we're going to talk about that too. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right, so I'm going to switch over and show you guys our beautiful PowerPoint. Boom, look at that. Wow. So before we get started, as we like to say here on Interstage Window, we are not a spoiler-free podcast. You will hear spoilers. You will hear um, also uh, problematic things like, you know, uh, anime in the 90s, even um, for kids stuff, it was relatively dark. So we're going to get into a couple of things. So here's your warning now. If you're a sensitive person or you hate spoilers, you can come back later. See ya. Bye. Okay. (laughs) We can be be a little problematic with our hot takes. And so we own that (laughs) instead of pretending to be ashamed of it that's right that's right so yes sailor moon crystal in the name of reboots that was season two if you want to watch season one you can go back and watch the vod on my youtube channel this is season two don't worry we'll do season three as well (laughs) all right well to get started as we do with every single episode uh karen my dear what was your favorite thing of season two Okay, so my favorite thing in season two is finally, like partway through this season, somebody is like, oh my God, you have a talking cat. (laughs) So there is this um, mom moment with Makoto where she befriends this, um, this boy here. And um, and they have sort of this little uh, romantic undertones friendship throughout a couple of the episodes towards the beginning. And um, one of the ways that uh, that this develops and blossoms is that uh, he confronts her and says, your friend has a talking cat. The fuck? Explain. Like, I need answers. What the heck? And uh, she basically explains it to him. She says, you know, we're reincarnated aliens from the moon and we fight for love and justice. Um, and he's like, like his mind is blown. Um, And I really love this moment for several reasons. Like one, yeah, the Sailor Guardians just like regularly talk strategy out in the open at cafes and at the arcade and all these things. And it's like, what? Why did it take so long for there to be this little subplot? Um, But it does. And this is true in the manga too. And, uh, and also it is just this wonderful little bit of character development for Makoto. So we really get to see that domestic 
side of her, which we we know from the first season exists because she loves cooking and she had even sewed her own little lunch bag um, and she lives by herself so she doesn't have anyone else to do the domestic things for her. So we get to see this kind of like uh, mother-ish relationship that she has with this kid and uh, the way that she goes about explaining their secret uh, to somebody. And it's just it's just this really nice kind of bit um, of of what happens to the girls. And it doesn't really go anywhere. Like, I don't want to, it's not like a, a big deal or anything. It really is a character development moment for Makoto um, and not really much else. But I absolutely love it. <laughs> love it too. I, yes. also, um, I also appreciate when medias do this where like where they they break the fourth wall without directly looking into camera sort of thing where it's like yeah we know the rules are a little ridiculous and that you're we're asking you to suspend your belief a lot and we appreciate it so we're going to give you a small little like yeah no you're probably wondered or wondering at some point how no one's noticed the cat is talking so we're going to give you a little bit of it mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Love it. So that's it's my beautiful. favorite thing from this uh from this season. Landon, what is your favorite thing from season 2? Well, just to be a little problematic. Um Dark Lady is everything. <laughs> everything I want in a hot anime girlfriend. Uh <laughs> she's angry, she's mature. Look at that hair. Uh she's powerful and she's sexy and she knows it. Uh, you know, ignore the fact that she's a small child in a full grown woman's body. It's amazing. It's a, she's amazing. She's just a badass hot villain, hero turned villain that I love. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, no, I think that she's fantastic. I like that she's like this embodiment of, of female rage, uh, but at the same time is still being manipulated. So like it's, there's an interesting commentary that exists in those dynamics that we'll kind of get into a little bit later this episode. Um, but it's it's fantastic. And she's she's awesome. <laughs> it's true. Black Lady is a great character. Absolutely love her. Um, and uh, and I didn't really understand like the symbolic implications of like what Chibiusa goes through in this arc um until you know much much later in life when i was watching this as a kid i was just like what you know she gets to be cool because she turns evil like i had a very simplistic view of it uh but re-watching it as an adult um you know i i have a much better appreciation and of course when it comes to sailor moon i've seen many versions of it uh over the years so i'm not saying this was something i realized necessarily from crystal um, but it, uh, it was really nice kind of seeing it all together in anime form like that. And this was the, this was like the part that I have no memory as a child of watching. So like the fact that like the crystal is really the first time I was introduced to this arc. So I think that gives me a special little like realization of being like, wow, not only was I, was I an adult when I first watched this, uh, but I do get all the implications of what Shibiusu goes through. Uh, mm-hmm. and 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 what this symbolizes for her. Uh, mm-hmm. And I love it. I think it's such great storytelling. Especially yeah, and it is in a world that plays with like age and different aspects of personality and existences and futures. Uh, this is a great way to do one of her arcs. Yes, exactly. All of that for sure. Love, love, love um the arc that she goes through towards the end of the season. Yes. Her entire arc is. It Wonderful. really is. But the, Excellent the, turn writing. Into the, the turn into Black Lady is just so good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. But for those of you who might not have watched Crystal recently or might have, it's been a little while, we're going to bring it down for you specifically because it's an anime. Karen's going to talk about it. So Karen, give us a plot synopsis of everything that happened this season. What? Two Karen plot synopsises in a row? Oh my gosh, yes. Okay, plot synopsis of season two. If you do not remember or um, or you have never seen Sailor Moon, I don't understand how that happened, but just in case, here we go. 
So at the beginning of season two, we're introduced to Chibiusa, a little girl who falls from the sky, and she enmeshes herself into Usagi's and Mamoru's life. Usagi's reaction is jealousy and annoyance, while Mamoru prefers to take on the role of protecting the literal child that is all alone that fell into their laps. (laughs) <laughs> um, meanwhile, our new enemy, the Black Moon Clan, who are of course looking for the legendary silver crystal, begin to abduct the Sailor Guardians one by one. So slowly over the first few episodes, Usagi is separated from Rei, then Ami, then Makoto, and finally Minako. Meanwhile, we find out more about Chibiusa. She is from the future and seeking Usagi's legendary silver crystal from the past. So this, what I'm saying is it's Usagi's present, it's Chibiusa's past. So we're calling this the past legendary crystal, even though it's the present. I hope that makes sense. So yeah, so they decide um, to uh, to use Chibiusa's space-time key to open a door to the future. In the future, they meet Queen Serenity and King Endemion and find out that they are the future versions of Usagi and Mamoru, as well as Chibiusa's parents. So we get a little, another little layer to like the future past thing that's going on um, with Usagi and Sailor Moon there. So that means Chibiusa is Usagi's future daughter. Blah, 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 blah. What? Epic Zoom. Oh, my God. This um, 14-year-old also- <laughs> girl is so freaked out. <laughs> yeah, she's freaking out. And also Chibiusa is literally a 900-year-old lolly because moon people live forever or whatever. Um, and Chibiusa is somehow, has somehow like lost the ability to grow up. So she got, she got stuck at um, elementary school age. Um, so, yes. <laughs> Sailor Moon does it too. Um, So drama ensues when Usagi gets stuck on the Black Moon Clan's planet, Nemesis, and then Chibiusa is separated from everybody. And while Chibiusa is separated, she encounters Wise Man, the leader of the Black Moon Clan, who promises her power that she's always expected to gain. So, okay, a side effect of Chibiusa not growing up is she never gets power. So most moon people have powers. She ain't got no powers. It's a problem. Um, So through this, Chibiusa becomes Black Lady, a version of herself with a properly aged body for how old she actually is, but unfortunately evil. Also, Black Lady coerces Mamoru, and we get to some evil tuxedo mask again for just a tiny little bit. Um, Usagi, while uh, trapped on Nemesis, is able to save her friends, but now they all have to go save Mamoru and Chibiusa and defeat the enemy at the same time. So there's a showdown where the Sailor Guardians have to prevent the past and present legendary silver crystal from touching. Okay, they cannot touch. (laughs) They're the same crystal they can't touch. Yeah, exactly. No touchy. It's very intense. The enemies are very evil, but the team is able to rescue Mamoru and Chibiusa, and then they all team up to defeat the evil and save the day. And yes, Chibiusa joins the fight too. When she is saved, she turns back into her child body, but now she has the power that she always expected to have. She's a Sailor Guardian. She's Sailor Chibi Moon. Yay! Okay, so everything's happy. Evil is defeated. Everyone parts ways and goes back to their respective times and locations, but they have a lot of mixed feelings about going back to normal life with the enemy defeated and everything they know now about what's going to happen to all of them in the future. But then, just at the last minute, it turns out that Chibiusa is going to stay with Usagi while she trains to be a better Sailor Guardian. So yes, we did not get rid of her. She will appear again in the next season. And that's season two. Because she's (laughs) the best Sailor Scout. Love me some Chibi Moon. Uh, That is one of my faves. (laughs) Always has Yes, and she's she's great in the next season, too. Um, I'm really excited to talk about that as well. But yeah, so that that is uh, season two of Sailor Moon Crystal, the yes. end. I do also, and we'll talk about this through, like later on, but just like loving how it starts the season with like Ch- uh, Chibiusa comes down, like literally falls from the sky and interrupts like a moment between Mamoru and Asagi, and then kind of does the same thing at the end, except we're much happier about it at the end. And it's just so good. <laughs> 
I don't understand that, how that happened, but all right. Oh, yeah, that was when we were talking about Dark Lady. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, Jane. But, you know, it was different when we were watching the show as kids because they would play a new episode every single day. So if you didn't watch it for a couple of months or if you started later than that, you know, depending on your age, there are whole arcs you could have missed. So I can see how it would happen. Cartoon Network just knew that if I saw Black Lady at the age I was when I was watching Sailor Moon, I would not have survived. I would have just like been like, I'm gonna be evil because that's what evil looks like and it's hot. <laughs> um, I would also like to acknowledge before we move forward with this presentation that the animation in season two is much improved. Landon okay. mentioned that at the beginning, but I just want to take a moment to say that like um, they heard us, they heard the bitchin', um, and season two actually has. Uh, on par animation with other big budget animes. Now, it's not as best as it can be. Season three animation gets even better, but in season two, it looks like a normal anime. It doesn't look like hot garbage the way that season one did. So if you were super turned off by Sailor Moon Crystal because of the crappy animation, I encourage you to just start at season two. And I think you'll have a real good time. No, so yeah, I, it's it's much improved. Yeah. Um, I also like the soundtrack better this season. I too. agree. It's a yeah. it's a bop. It's All right, bop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but let's talk about we talked about last time, like how Sailor Moon took over the world. It suddenly like boomed out of Japan and was everywhere. This is kind of the season where it's explaining the reasons why we paid attention, because not only did we pay attention a little bit in the first season. But there's a lot of tropes and connections here that really made the young girls of the world want to pay attention to this show. Uh, so let's talk about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Landon's own Luna is in the background I'm giving her so, advice. So, <laughs> so talking today. He was, he was really talking in the pre-show that Karen and I had. And he's not stopped since. <laughs> we debated kicking him out, but I thought it added flavor since we're talking about Sailor Moon and maybe he can be Luna giving advice. <laughs> I did. I did threaten. I was like, if you meow one more time, I got to kick you out. And then he stopped meowing. And now as soon as we started again, he's like, I can meow now because she won't kick me out in front of the people. <laughs> <laughs> but yes um so in season one uh the reason sailor moon i feel like is is really popular in season one is because it's a great play opportunity because what do kids want out of their media they want to be able to take that and go play with their friends like they want to go play sailor moon with their friends they want to watch a dinosaur show and then go play dinosaurs with their friends right like they want to watch power rangers and go play power rangers with their friends and you got the different color-coded characters with the different cool personalities so you know you can pick your favorite and fight over it with your friends about who gets to be which sailor guardian and then you can go play on the playground so like season one really exemplifies that with like each individual character getting their introduction and then they all go and fight evil, right? And of course it's got the the romance between Usagi and Mamoru, um, which makes it uh, a four girls thing, but they still fight and stuff. So we get good play opportunities and good romance. Um, but in season two, it's a little bit different, right? The girls are getting older, uh, the viewers are getting older. And what I really love is in season two, you start to really notice that what makes Sailor Moon special compared to other 90s cartoons that we had access to in the US is it doesn't talk down to us. Okay, like it's dark and it's serious and it says, it's cool, you can handle it. That's what Sailor Moon says. It's not only it's cool that you can handle it, it's your, it's cool you can relate to it even if you don't relate to like the exact imagery that's that exists here all of the themes are presented in a way that is accessible to to young women of any age mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and you know we have a whole bunch of examples here on screen and that we're going to talk about as to how this really does speak to young women in a, and I know we talked about this a little bit last time, but in a genre that wasn't really speaking to young women, a lot of the cartoons that were existed on Cartoon Network, on this, miss, on, on Tsunami, missed the, the, uh, missed the audience, missed the mark on the audience for young girls. Yeah, uh, it was like you aged out of the kids' cartoons and then there wasn't anything much to follow. 
right? Like you kind of had to just jump into adult stuff, yeah. right? Um, because basically what we were experiencing was that most uh, quote unquote girls media was very low conflict. And so once you reached a certain age, the truth is it was boring. You know what I mean? Like I was a My Little Pony kid, like I watched My Little Pony, but those earlier seasons of My Little Pony, they're unbearable now because there's literally no conflict. Like it's, it's, it's just, it's bad. Um, and a lot of uh, girls' media from the 80s and early 90s is pretty similar. So when Sailor Moon came on the scene, and it was obviously clearly for girls, and there was serious conflict, it was like, like my mind was blown. And yeah. um, and I didn't really recognize that's what was happening at the time, but that's absolutely what it was and why my friends and I were so freaking obsessed with mm -hmm. Sailor Moon. And we don't want to erase the fact that like girls in anime still existed. They absolutely did. There are your Dragon Ball Z girls. There are the girls who are obsessed with Yu-Gi-Oh, who are <laughs> obsessed with Pokemon, all of those kinds of shows. But those shows were, for the majority, advertised and geared towards young boys. Mm -hmm. uh, and the conflicts yeah. on the surface, I, I cannot speak to Dragon Ball Z because I have not seen it. But for the most part, from what I'm getting were pretty low, like there, there wasn't as many thematic messages being presented as there necessarily is towards young girls in Sailor Moon. So there because, definitely is a lot of good okay. theming in Dragon Ball and stuff like that, but it's not, it's not like targeted specifically towards yeah. women. Uh, yeah, this is targeted for women, whereas mm -hmm. everything else was kind of just targeted towards men and then women had to get on board because that yep. was what... He, that's what the audience or that's what the media thought was the audience because yeah. they had never tried to capture anyone else yep that's the kind of cartoons they were making that's the cartoons they were choosing to bring over from japan but sailor moon was different sailor moon was not only for girls but it was high stakes and it was action packed and it's and it's also like the villains specifically so i want to take a, a moment to talk yes about the villains. Um, there's several different things that happen here. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the themes later, but I just want to acknowledge that like when Usagi gets, uh, gets taken into Nemesis, like the first reaction that they have towards her is like, oh my God, it's a young queen serenity. I must have her. And this screenshot is literally like moments before you think Usagi is going to get R-worded. And then, you know, she pushes him off and runs away because, I mean, we're not going to, they're not going to go that far, but oh my God, they almost do. Like he really, truly almost. And yes, Jane, that is absolutely true. The truth. Um, here we go. It This season is very hot, you guys. It's very, very hot. <laughs> It is, but that is also, but that's something that like uh, so many girls who at this age could recognize because where this was being really advertised to was girls, preteens to teenagers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a little, maybe a little younger, but for the most part, that's where it existed. Yeah. So you have girls who all of a sudden are being, are noticing people sexualizing them or starting mm -hmm. to and not having control of that. So having that exist in the media that they are that they are taking in made a bunch of girls feel seen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a way that also villainized the characters yes. villainized the villains made us feel uncomfortable as women but a familiar uncomfortable Yes. So it's, and it's not, and it's the reverse too. So it has um, parts that show like what it's like to have um, sexuality pushed on you from somebody mm -hmm. that you're not interested in receiving it from. And then it's also um, from like uh, Chibiusa's perspective, what it feels like to be incredibly sexual and not be noticed yes. for it and, um, and have your sexuality ignored when it's just coming into fruition and i think um you know pretty much every girl i know relates to if not both at least one side of that mm -hmm. um and so you've got kind of both sides of that and and at the same time there's also like these little competitions and things that happen with the villains as well. Like I want to talk a second about uh, one of the early episodes. This is when everybody's getting kidnapped in the first in the first several episodes. So Amy's um, kidnapping, yeah. So Amy's kidnapping uh, happens from one of the villains, Fisheye, who challenges her to a chess match, right, or a chess match, and um, and they they play chess, and it and it, and it, it ends with uh, Amy 
getting um, abducted, right? But the point is, is that each of the girls is attacked for the thing that makes them special. And it's not necessarily like the Sailor Scout part of them, but it's their like, it's their other power. Like basically Amy's smarts are attacked. And this, this is like probably the most overt clear one that happens. That's why I bring it up specifically. Um, but I think most girls can relate to that too. Cause as you get older and you start to gain actual skills, what's the first thing that most of us encounter? Someone that wants to beat that away from you, that wants you to stop and to bottle up what makes you special and not encourage you because that is threatening for a girl to actually have skills. Um, so, so basically all of these different encounters within this season, um, you're going to find something where you're like, oh shit, I went through like the real life version of that Mm -hmm. as a young girl. Um, very, very relatable with the way that the villains, um, interact with our heroes. Well, even, and then we have like, um, Makoto, like even in the screenshot alone, the idea of her attack, like being attacked by herself. Like that is something too of like the that physical representation of constantly putting ourselves down, constantly having the self doubt, the like being fearful of ourselves, uh, and it's an it's just an interesting way of portraying it. And mm-hmm. the subtle the subtle ways that all of these are portrayed goes to show the showrunners were obviously female, were obviously trying like knew their audience, knew how to write for their audience, and knew the nuance behind it. Mm -hmm. Uh, because in any sort of male ran show, this would not exist. Right. I mean, it's, it's in the, it's in the original source material, but the way that it's portrayed in this, like there's just so much more care in this season with Mm -hmm. getting at the essence of what's actually happening in the manga, as opposed to just like frame by frame, recreating it the way that it was in the first season. So it makes you, this season makes you feel a lot more feelings. (laughs) It does. And as an adult, we can now interpret all of these like the deranged monsters we are, which is what mm-hmm. that makes this season so incredibly hot. <laughs> yes. And as, but as kids, like, I mean, even though you, I wouldn't have been able to articulate any of this as a kid, I can still like recognize as a child these things because, um, because I can feel them. Like I can, I can feel what the characters are feeling. And even if I can't put it into words, I can know that it's relatable um so yeah like this season this season uh so much better i love it so much better than when i was watching it as a child and we're gonna get to why i was not as much of a fan of this arc as a kid (laughs) but i still loved these elements of it even as a kid um the villains like they're just so good they're so good yeah and i don't we don't spend a lot of time talking about her this episode so i do want to bring it back to black lady very quickly as Mm -hmm. far as like that idea of her repression is what causes her to like feel that rage her lack of autonomy in her own body the fact that she can't grow the fact that she can't have the relationships that she wants to have even though she's old enough to have them all of that channels into her rage and she is then easy to manipulate Mm -hmm. uh and becomes part of the villain and it's also really cool to see a character that we've learned to love through the season become a villain Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um because so many of the other villains we've met are just off the bat mean bad people that we then later learn they're either being mind controlled or that they have a history or a past uh this one is like oh we're meeting the character and then her arc is that she becomes the villain and that's part of it (laughs) yep yep and uh and and you're right like she literally does this because she gets coerced because someone says like ah there's a vulnerable young girl with um with budding sexuality let me just like slip right on in there and give her what she thinks she wants she'll be happy temporarily um that's what's what happens to her and uh and a lot of a lot of girls unfortunately have that exact experience in their lives Again, the nuance, so good in this season. So good. Mm -hmm. Love it. All right. Shall we get to the most, not problematic, but the thing that turns people off the most this season? Yes. Let's talk about it. (laughs) That would be Misagi. Yes. Our main protagonist. (laughs) Uh, The main character, if you would. Uh, And the most annoying person on a te- on this TV show. <laughs> mhm. To say the least. Jesus. <laughs> um 
I, as, as you guys who have been watching my content for a while know, I can't handle jealousy. I have a very short fuse for it. When someone is jealous, I cannot tolerate it. I don't feel a lot of those feelings myself in, in most cases. Um, so I have a lot of trouble relating to it. Um, and so watching this as a kid, I was just waiting for Usagi to just get the heck over herself and treat the 10 year old girl in front of her like an actual 10 year old girl instead of a romantic rival. It's just fucking ridiculous. It just is. Okay. Like Usagi and Mamoru are together and yet Usagi cannot just realize that Mamoru is just trying to take care of the child that has not, that's, that's missing her parents, that doesn't have anyone else really taking care of her. And it's a good thing that she was able to stay with Usagi's mom. And yes, like she had to do this little cute mind control umbrella thingy to make it happen so that she could keep her secret that she's from the future. But you know what? Like, she cannot live on her own. So what the heck are they supposed to do? And in the original anime, of course, this lasts for many, many episodes. Oh my God, it goes so on long. forever. So long, yes. And so Usagi, much filler. <laughs> yes, and she just doesn't stop. She just doesn't stop. She's so jealous, and I have She's, such a low tolerance for it. She doesn't stop, and there isn't growth. Like that's the other thing too. If there's going to be growth, then that's fine. But because of how many filler episodes there are, there isn't any growth. <laughs> Not really. It's just Not forever really. jealous of a ten-year-old. Mm-hmm. And in in the in this um in Crystal. It's a little bit more tolerable. Also, this art gets more tolerable as I age because I realize that, like, actually, this is super relatable and normal. And Karen, you're the freak. <laughs> the same thing, actually, because here's the deal. Like, I had the opposite experience. Um, because of being a hyper-emotional child, uh, I related, didn't even relate, but I understood Usagi to the level of, like, like, grasping onto it and projection sort of aspect of being like, no way. I completely understand why Usagi is feeling this way and is being upset. And of course I'm 10, so I can't, I'm just like, yeah, I'm on Usagi's team, blah, 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 and completely relating to it. Uh, and as I get older and re-watching it, I'm like, oh no, she's terrible. She's <laughs> terrible. Uh, and realizing that like it's really good storytelling and there's there's really good elements here and that it is a tale of growth and growing up and that we must treat her with grace because she is a 15 year old kid still uh, but at the same time there is growth especially in Crystal where it's only 12 episodes long uh, instead of the 40 or 50 that was the original anime um, yeah. and it's like okay this is this is fine but also Usagi is wrong <laughs> she is she is wrong um but luckily by the end of this she does admit that actually she does like chibiusa and um and she doesn't come out and say it exactly because you know a feeling is not something that you can just banish away she does still have these jealous feelings but she sort of recognizes that it doesn't really matter if she feels jealous she still needs to be there for this girl who is a child and that will be her child someday um and that it's okay actually for her to to be there and um hang out with them and it's really not as big of a deal as she made it out to be I think I think the thing that makes it hard to swallow as a watcher, especially as an adult, uh, is is recognizing that all the characters around her are incredibly more mature than her. Um, so not only do we have like, oh, there is this small child who's even more mature than Usagi is, but all of her friends and all of her family are more mature than Usagi and are expecting her to grow up quicker than she's capable of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's an interesting plot and arc on its own that makes it very relatable to young girls because it's like this want of catching up, this want of growing up, but not being able to, which mm -hmm. I feel is a, is a very universal young adult but also a very universal woman experience mm -hmm. um of being in, stuck in the middle of being like i want to be older than i am but also no one's letting me be an adult 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Usaki definitely does. Like, you get the feeling, um, especially through her interactions with Mamoru and Chibiusa specifically, is that Usagi does want to be that adult. There's um, there's a part... Um, there's a part towards the end where she sort of reconciles herself currently with her future self. We're going to talk more about that a little bit later. But you kind of see through that that she really does have within her a desire to grow up. She's she's not... And back in the 90s, this was normal. I know there's a lot of... Um, a sentiment right now where kids seem very scared to grow up, but the world is different now and the world is a lot scarier than it was in the 90s. And back then, growing up didn't seem like this particularly scary thing where, oh no, all of a sudden I'm going to have to be responsible and pay bills. Like we all wanted and also, it. And also to throw in there that kids are far more grown up now than they are in the yes. 90s versus yes. where kids were when we were in fifth grade versus where they are now is, yeah, there. there's no similarities. Yeah, the internet's changed everything. Um, so yeah, so it's not like kids can't even grow up because they're more grown up than they were when we, they were <laughs> like when we were that age. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's a good thing, but that is not... I think that is true. I think that is true. But yeah, there was there was this deep desire for most young girls to grow up. Like we wanted to, we wanted that freedom, we wanted that um that power that comes with being an adult and mm-hmm. ma- able to make your own decisions and actually own your own things and um and uh and you just had this belief that like oh once i'm a woman instead of a girl then i will actually be able to own my emotions and people won't try to push me around anymore and tell me what to do anymore um spoilers that's not really how it works but that's kind of what you think when you're a kid and you have this very simplistic idea of what adulthood is like and uh usagi very much wants to grow up she she wants to um eventually you know be at that point in her life um and so uh, so she has all of her friends that are more mature than her, her boyfriend that is way more mature than her. We'll and talk about that uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, and so she she sees all of this and she's like, well, gosh, they all think Chibius is cool. Like we even have Luna, who if you remember from season one, Luna was very suspicious of Mamaru. Like, is he on our side? Is he um, is he a, a villain? Whatever. But um, but Luna has no such qualms about Chibiusa. Luna sees a child as she is, and basically advises Usagi to calm the fuck down. And uh, so everyone, literally everyone around her is saying like, this is a child. Stop having expectations of them. But it's it's interesting because I think there's a lot of, I think that tells a lot about the expectations that she might feel. Mm -hmm. Because in all of this conversation of Chibiusa wanting to be an adult, There is another life of her that her and all her friends live where they are constantly putting their lives and body safety and everything on the line and are doing adult things by saving the world, right? So, like, there's that interesting idea of, like, maybe she's putting so much on on, um, Chibiusa because she feels so much has been put on her. Mm -hmm. And it's, like, that interesting insight into a hint of character that exists. Whereas where she doesn't have any leniency because she is certainly older than Chibiusa is, but she is not willing to get, she looks at Chibiusa almost as a peer. So that shows her like that inner look of how Usagi sees herself. Mm -hmm. And I think it's undeniable, like before you, before you know, and before Usagi knows that they are actually related and and mother and daughter and all of that. um, I think Usagi recognizes her younger self in Chibiusa pretty Mm -hmm. instantly. And, uh, and, and that's quite a force to be reckoned with. Like, I don't know if I would want to meet my younger self. I think I would be a pissed off and annoyed with my younger self all the time too. <laughs> also, like, I think that there's something there too that, that plays into the jealousy of sometimes her friends aren't the nicest to Chibusa. They, they love her. They're very kind. She is the butt of a lot of jokes. She yeah. always has been, deserved or not. So all of a sudden you have somebody who is more beloved by the people that you care about than you, and you see a lot of yourself in, that jealous, I can 100% understand where that jealousy sort of thing comes from, because it is part of her insecurity. She hasn't discovered the parts of herself that are secure and who she is yet. Mm -hmm. By the end of the season, going into next season, she will start that arc. But for this particular season, she's still stumbling with like the who am I in this world. Mm-hmm. Very much so. Very much so. 
Yep, she did not figure it out in season one, as you might have thought. There's still lots and lots of growth to go through. Which is fine. I mean, yeah. When you discover that you're actually a long lost moon princess alien, that <laughs> does make you question how you're going to exist in this world a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yes. But yeah, so um, Usagi in this in this particular season, uh, when I was younger, absolutely hated her. Like, I, there was other parts of the season that I liked that, that made me watch it. But every time Usagi was on screen, I was like, oh my fucking God, when she's going to go away. <laughs> she won't. Uh, she's the main character. She's literally yeah, she never the main did. character. <laughs> she never did. So as a kid, this was my least favorite arc of Sailor Moon um, because of that. I see your kitty cat agrees with me. Thank you for the validation. Apparently. <laughs> but, um, but as an adult, I, I've kind of flipped that. I feel like the annoyance that Usagi makes me feel um, is uh, is valid and a beautiful artistic choice instead of something that's actually just annoying me. Yeah, I think instead of the righteous rightness that I had as a kid of Usagi is right in this situation, I, more aware of the context of everything else, can appreciate more of the side character struggles and still have the grace for this character to realize that this is where she's at where every with everybody else it, and it's an interesting way to tell a story yeah mm-hmm. and i like it it's a good yeah. story it's really i good think story. that especially when we're having a messages sent to young women we have to have characters like this mm-hmm. uh because children who are still the receivers of these of this show like that that preteen age that preteen teenager age are still children Mm -hmm. and and they deserve at times to be treated as such yep i would agree with that um yes usagi grows a lot but she grows the most in her relationship with mamaru yeah which is what we're going to discuss next yep It's a love story, you guys. We can't forget Sailor Moon at its core is the love story of Usagi and Mamoru. So we have to talk about it. (laughs) Because I can't think of a, like an, I can't think of an American cartoon medium that is essentially a romance. Like trying to think of like, Back, especially back in the 90s when this was popular trying to think of something that is like that this that this is its very core yes it's a fighty show yes it's a girl power show but it's a romance um it feels very new and fresh in a way that didn't hit media before yeah it definitely did at the time um for sure so uh so we want to talk about a couple of things in regards to uh, Mamoru and Usagi's relationship um, because guess what in 2022 we can't watch anything without some discourse so here we go we know the internet is like you know infested with aunties who are refused to do actual uh, media analysis and instead just want to talk about how it's problematic and yes there is a pretty significant age gap here um usagi is in middle school and mamaru is in high school and as the characters progress usagi eventually goes into high school and mamaru goes into college um you know they uh they have basically a four-year age gap i think maybe four years and some months and by the time that they're hundreds and hundreds of years old uh ruling the moon kingdom nobody cares but right now it is an age gap that actually um means a little bit of something and so everyone on the internet wants to say how problematic it is now the show never addresses that it's not about that um but the internet uh loves to talk about that aspect so uh so Landon what are what are your thoughts on that aspect of the show I think that there is value in real critique on the trope of a adult man and a young teenage girl that is a trope that is prevalent and not even an adult man uh men that are thousands of years old (laughs) <laughs> with barely out of a barely 16 year old people looking at you edward cullen looking at anyone on the vampire diaries looking <laughs> looking at most tropes that exist uh in any sort of supernatural fantasy 
media. I think that there is fair critique there. And this does fall into that subject section. I think Sailor Moon is unique in its existence because even though the core of the show is a romance, the, the Mamaru and Usagi are like the least romantic couple at this point in time. Yes, there we, are. Usagi has so many horny interactions with everyone except Mamaru. Yes. <laughs> except we see their future selves also being incredibly romantic and somewhat horny. Uh, but the current modern day, like the the most, I think the most chemistry and horny they can get is when they're both Tuxedo Mask and Sailor Moon. Mm-hmm. And even then we're kind of expected to believe that this is a secondary like existence of themselves. So yes, so that's like more their in like forever ageless sort of versions of themselves. Yes. It, so it's it's interesting. I understand it. And I think that it belongs in the conversation of why didn't she just, they just, the showrunners just not make her high school age to begin with. Like, I think there are questions that can be questioned about this and discussions that can be had. Shipping it is not problematic because at the end of the day, this the, it, there's nothing romantic between current modern day Mamaru and Usagi. There really isn't. So, okay, so a couple of things in regards to this. I do think that there's valid um, critique and analysis when, like, why is that trope so common and prevalent? Like, that's an interesting question. Saying Sailor Moon is problematic, I don't yeah. understand why people ship it. Like, are, are you daft? Like, are you dumb? Like, it is. it is a pure fantasy. Like, wouldn't it be nice if you could be in middle school and have a high school boyfriend that was actually wholesome and cared about you and that your parents like, wouldn't that be nice? Yes, it would be nice, you know? And that does happen sometimes in real life and it's not a big deal, you know? Um, the So the critique the critique and the analysis is in why is this trope so prevalent? I, I hate when people bring it to specific shows as if that is meaningful, as if um, your consumption of a, a specific show that utilizes that trope has anything to do with your values. And I totally agree as far as like the lack of sexiness in this couple. Usagi's interactions with um with basically all of the Sailor Scouts when she meets them way more horny. Sailor yes. uh, Sailor Moon's interaction with um the the prince in this particular season, like the horniest th- scene that has Usagi in it in like the entire show. Mamoru is nowhere to be seen at that point. Also, um, and it Mamoru's, keeps going. Also, Mamoru's interactions. Like I'm thinking, yes. Mamoru's interactions when he is evil uh, with with uh, Black Lady. I'm thinking with Beryl in yes. the first season. Way like, hornier. He also has hornier interactions with anybody but yes. Usagi. Um, yes, because the story of the love story of Sailor Moon, it, it, it's a getting there point. Mm-hmm. right it's like it's not about usagi and mamaru it's about the fact that they are to be faded that they were to be faded yeah and that we're watching that develop where they're at now yeah it's a soulmate story exactly it is um and yeah i agree with you as far as like when you write off a show because of a trope that is problematic and you just write off the whole show you're you're not playing into the nuance and you're not gaining the information you need to understand the problematic of this yes right like you can absolutely use this as an example of how like popular this trope is but when you're trying to compare the predatory nature of this trope to other shows that have that same trope this doesn't this isn't even a candle in the same room right like this it's not even the same story (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> when you consider this as part of the whole of Sailor Moon, like there's nothing problematic about Usagi and Mamaru's relationship. There just isn't. There just or isn't. The whole, or the whole of the me- like the whole of the trope in, the, in within media. It's like there are a thousand other examples of this trope being used, which is way creepier. Mm. Way creepier. In fact, there are hundreds, not hundreds, but there are tens of examples in Sailor Moon 
where mm-hmm. that trope is way creepier. <laughs> way creepier age gaps in other parts of Sailor Moon. Yes. Yes. <laughs> or just like the tension between like villains just absolutely like needing to have like the all the villains this season needing to be have uh especially Diamond and Diamond and needing to have Usagi because she will be Neo Queen Serenity. It's like, okay, this is weird. That's that's <laughs> more problematic and gross for the purpose that it needs to be than yes. Usagi and and uh Monaru. Yes. Sorry, yeah, I'm so we're trying to control my levels. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're good. It actually looked pretty good, I think on the at least the little sound bar but anyway yes um so yeah the next time i see like i don't like sailor moon anyway because it's got a weird age gap i just know that you are either a liar or you have never watched sailor moon never watched the show a hundred percent yeah um and that's frustrating because Mm -hmm. it's a cool way because they're also their ages are so not a part of it (laughs) <laughs> right like the purpose of the age gap i truly believe is to a give a reasonable explanation as to where why mamaru can live on his own and have his own apartment and b to really showcase the maturity difference when handling chibiusa because we have mamaru who's about to go off to college uh, who can take care of this 10 year old who's just landed in his lap yeah. versus Usagi who is entering her first year of high school and cannot. <laughs> no, absolutely cannot. Um, and, and it's, and it's true when it comes to Sailor Moon, the whole reason that Mamaru is older is the same exact reason that all of Usagi's friends are more mature than her. Usagi is the main character and is therefore going through the most amount of growth. Like, mm-hmm. and that's all that there is to it. It's just that they couldn't also make the friends older. The friends needed to be her same age because that wouldn't make no sense. <laughs> yes. also, so that's it. Slightly off topic, but if any aunties are at this point and watching this clip, I need to say this. If you have an issue with Mamaru and Usagi, but you do not have an issue with any of the other thousands of examples like Vampire Diaries or anything like that, because they look closer in age and the actors are adults, you're a hypocrite. <laughs> it's true. It's true. A thousand year age gap, way worse than a four year age gap. <laughs> way worse. <laughs> it's true. It's true. A four year age gap, at least, um, definitely happens in real life. And, uh, and you got to take it on a case by case basis. And won't matter. And no. won't matter in 200 years. <laughs> no. The and we know that, year, the and we know that they live. Still matter. <laughs> yes. And we know that they live at least a thousand years since um, Chibiusa is a, is a uh, 900 year old lolly. And again, literally. <laughs> way more romantic as Queen Serenity and, and uh, oh my gosh. Uh, Endemian. 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 Yeah. Then, then Usagi and Mamaru could ever yes. wish to be. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yep. All right, but speaking of uh, 900-year-old lollies. Oh, yeah. Another important relationship that exists, and I kind of hinted at it, is Mamoru, or is Usagi and Shibusa. Yes. And they're changing our relationship. So this is the core of the season. The core of this season is Usagi and Shibusa going through their arcs to ultimately deal with what they need to deal with. So for Usagi, that is working through her intense, jealous emotions and feelings of self-worth so that she can become an adult. And for Chibiusa, it is working through her intense feelings of jealousy and self-worth so that she can become an adult. They go on the same arc, what? Oh my god. Oh my god. Daughter. What? (laughs) Um (laughs) and that they go on it in two very different ways that kind of like weave in and out of each other. Like um uh Chibiusa unfortunately is literally taken advantage of by an older man um and is forced to grow up very quickly. Mm -hmm. And um and Usagi, yeah. And Usagi, on the other hand, um is being held with uh with much more uh, gentle care as far as where she is pushed in growing up. And, um, and, and the way that it feels at the end 
is that even though they go through on a, a very similar journey, um, Chibusa's feels uh, much more traumatic, despite the fact that Chibusa has already had 900 years of life before getting to this point. Uh, she she feels like she still has a lot of work, whereas Usagi feels like, oh, she made some real progress, you know, um, with by the end. Without trying to add, like, too much science in real life sense to this i like the idea that shibiusa still has a lot of growth and a lot more growth necessary than usagi does because physically and developmentally she is still younger it doesn't matter if she's 900 years old if you're 10 there are things that you can't handle like if your body is 10 your brain can't concept certain things yes uh and i enjoy that 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 makes sense still in this show because <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's made very clear with when um endymion is explaining all of this mm-hmm. like one day she just stopped growing and it's implied that she stopped growing in every way in yeah. body in mind and in her magic powers like all of it just halted and um and it's it's kind of this like mysterious like why why is chibiusa refusing to grow up nobody really knows um but she does she just and it, it is that interesting idea of Chibi Yusa is refu- is refusing it. This is not necessarily a accident. This is a choice that she is making. Uh, but so much of what we know of her character is constantly fighting against that. Mm-hmm. And it's like that interesting. It's the same again. I know it's the same arc, but it's that same internal struggle that Usaki is going through of Mm -hmm. I'm not ready to grow up and being an adult but I have to be Mm -hmm. um and and uh and then Shibiusa has the I'm maybe not ready to be an adult but I want to be Mm -hmm. but I can't (laughs) yep and you know what would be really cool it would be really cool if you're gonna have kids someday that you get like a crash course so that you can be siblings with your daughter and get to know yeah. them before you actually have your daughter yeah. like um you know so she's got a little practice run here is... before she has to be used to later <laughs> uh this is they're more like siblings they're more like siblings <laughs> this is a nightmare in my in my <laughs> mind no um it is i mean they are siblings for this season yeah. for lack of a better word right uh, Chibusa hypnotizes Usagi's parents into being like, hey, I'm also your kid. Uh, so they are siblings um, for the majority of this, which is also an interesting dynamic because that brings in the jealousy with Mamoru a little bit more. Yep. Um, and it's, I love it. I think it's great. And then I also think, spoilers to the third season, I like that the contentious sibling rivalry certainly toned down exists throughout the rest of the show Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep like even though usagi grows up and gets much better about this sort of stuff um feelings don't go away instantly and they don't go away instantly for usagi you know she continues to struggle with the way that she interacts with chibiusa she continues to struggle about the things that annoy her that chibiusa does but of course she does because they're all the same things that annoy her about herself (laughs) yes well and and also it We'll talk about the theme of motherhood in a second, but Usagi never feels like a mom to Chibiusa. Mm-mm. Mamoru definitely fills that role of like dad, but Usagi never steps into the role of mom, even though she will be in the future. They allow her to like keep her youth in that way mm-hmm. um, and still have a relationship with Chibiusa. Yeah. And Chibiusa never looks at her like mom too. Which no, is like really important. <laughs> yeah, Chibiusa never is like, oh, this is my future mom. I'm gonna treat her like mom. Like, no, like Ch- for Chibi in Chibiusa's mind, Queen Serenity that she left back in the future um, is her mom, and this girl is not her mom yet. But Mamaru can be daddy. Absolutely. <laughs> 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 both ways i hated that i hated that yeah chibiusa um obviously has a a massive electra complex um yeah <laughs> it is bad mm-hmm. uh but you know that's what happens when you accidentally still steal a silver crystal and then all is lost and you have to time travel in order to find it like mm-hmm. that's that's what ends up <laughs> happening is that you're like man i my mom is in a deep sleep and my dad is my only hero. And so I'm going to cling to his past self and also 
he's hot. <laughs> It's like when people on Twitter post those their like high school pictures of their their parents and they're like, My dad was kinda hot though. And yeah. it's like your dad was just way younger, friend. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, he he wasn't. He was a he was like an eight, but like or a seven, but like you know you're thirsty so <laughs> and it's also it's so funny because like in their mind it's like oh but he's old and it's like well you know if you think you're attractive then guess what when your parents were young they were probably attractive too just saying <laughs> saying um i love that no i think having that sibling rivalry is really is really the fundamental part of why we the audience also can fall in love with Chibiusa mm-hmm. um because if she was just like some kid that that um Usagi needed to save we wouldn't give two shits yeah I think so but because of that dynamic of like ha, 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 I'm gonna ruin your life and I'm your younger sister now and also I'm gonna try to steal your boyfriend uh but also I'm dead so it's not gonna work I think that that adding makes us as the audience be like this is hysterical or at least all the older siblings that had a younger sibling go yes they're annoying Mm -hmm. I want them to die (laughs) but in the least death kind of way (laughs) die with the least death yes (laughs) for sure for sure Um, I would like them to go back to the thousand years in the future so I never have to see them again Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) so yeah the core of this season really is Usagi's relationships with Mamoru and with Mm -hmm. Chibiusa. Those are really the things that we're deeply developing um, in this season right here. And a lot of the themes that we have go along with that. Yes, they do. They're they're mostly prevalent in this dynamic. Um, Yeah, I think that that's kind of... I just also think it's hysterical that Chibiusa's like first welcoming into this universe is that she literally holds a gun to Usagi's head uh well what would you do she falls from the sky and has a gun well what would you do if you needed to um go if you were 10 years old and you needed to go back to the past on a secret magical mission wouldn't you take a gun I think I'd take a gun I think I I'd take a gun. I don't think I, but I, uh, I, that's not my first instinct at all. Uh, my first instinct uh, would be to take the lottery answers for oh. the day at, before I arrive uh, or the day after I arrive so that whomever I'm trying to convince, I can give them the lottery answers and then they feel like they have to help me because I've proved I'm from the future. I don't think Chibius is that smart. I'm just saying like, she's real she's cute. 10, but I don't think so she's that I smart. Hope, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but we're asking what we would do, also, and that's what I would do. Do they have a do they have a lottery like um a, a daily lottery things like that in Japan? I don't know. I don't I, know if they have off that. the top of my head. Do not know. Yeah, I have no idea. I don't know if they have like quick lotteries the way we do. <clears throat> let me go- let me Google it while we do that. Uh, <laughs> but while I'm doing that, we can talk about our sponsor. Yes, we can. Okay, so before we get into the themes, let's talk about our sponsor. So Interstage Window, especially these podcast episodes, are sponsored by Audible. Um, We absolutely love Audible. Let me get you all the link. And uh, you can love Audible too. So you can start your 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash interstage window. And if you do that, you help out the show. So um, please, if you have not, you do not have Audible at this point, we highly encourage you to go sign up for it. And um, do we have a book recommendation for for this week? Okay, what are we recommending this week? Oh, I don't have a jacket on it, but this okay, that's is okay. Crescent City. This is the second one, but I'm oh. recommending the whole thing. Crescent, Crescent City by Sarah J. Moss uh, is a wonderful it's hard to explain it is a fantasy but very like existing in a contemporary setting so it, it's a different world a different plane but technology is very similar to that which we have here it just involves different races different peoples including fae and werewolf and uh vampire and a whole bunch of other different uh fae that are ex- different races that exist in this unique city, Crescent City, and the factions and kind of mafias that exist there. uh, We follow 
uh, a kind of murder mystery solve the problem uh, from a young girl who lost her best friend and has to kind of save the world because of it. And so there's some girl power, some relationships, some there's a little bit of jealousy thrown in there, uh, but there's also magical powers that we have yet to discover and a past history we don't really know. So I thought it connected to Sailor Moon pretty well. Yeah, I mean, fantasy set in the modern world, I think definitely with girl power, definitely a Sailor Moon-esque. So yes. um, great recommendation. Thank so you. yeah, if, if, you're, um, um, if you're interested, you can get that on Audible with our free trial. Also, to answer the important question, uh, Japan does have lotteries. They have uh, scratch tickets as well as a, un- a unique number lottery uh, that usually starts at around 600 million yen. And okay. And up to over a billion. Okay, well, so your plan would work in Japan. So yeah, Chibiusa yeah. could have done that, I suppose. <laughs> but I think we were supposed to take away that she was not very smart, instead hmm. just very aggressive. Yes, so. very aggressive. <laughs> uh, and I appreciate that it was a fake up. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Although we thought it was real for a hot second, I mean. And, and that pause in between seasons, 100% thought it was real. Yes, my God. <laughs> All right. Shall we go to our themes? Yes. Okay, we got some fun themes. We got some fun themes this season, you guys. It's great. And the first one is motherhood. Okay. You can't have you can't have a show directed to girls without this theme existing at some point. Mhm. And um and you know, it's you get different flavors of it. I, I tend to get tired of these themes if they drag on too long. I'll give you an example. Absolutely loved WandaVision. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, the, the way that they themed motherhood in that, where Wanda was kind of like she created this family and she was going through a lot and then she ended up having to lose the family. Here's what I didn't like when she comes back in um, in the new Doctor Strange movie and she's still pining and whining over the lost children like is she not allowed to do anything else luckily sailor moon is here for us and sailor moon is allowed to do other things than just be a mom (laughs) my other i just wanted to throw in an example for me personally since we're already talking about vampire diaries and that's any sort of cw show when they get about five seasons in all of a sudden needs to have a character that's pregnant and struggle with motherhood uh doesn't need to happen especially if that character is a vampire already dead doesn't need to have babies they did it's it true. Anyway. It's true. <laughs> but, but since Sailor Moon is a show about um, these characters that are moon aliens that live for thousands of years and uh, and build empires, obviously you do need to have some kind of heritage. Uh, they're going to have kids, okay? They're going to have kids, and so motherhood needs to come up. Um, and, whether, and it definitely and whether does. We, whether we like it or not, um, womanhood and motherhood by any and almost every society is inevitably linked Mm -hmm. uh, just because that's how patriarchy works. So this, any, any female main protagonist media will have the hints of motherhood in here. Mm -hmm. Um, We're accepting it because Chibiusa is her daughter. And so she gets to have fun with that acceptance. Yep. And luckily, Sailor Moon doesn't drag it out. Season three is not about motherhood. So that's great. You know, we don't, once we introduce motherhood, it actually does go away once the conflict um, of motherhood is resolved as it is in this season. Um, But I think it's, it also isn't her current, like it's the, it's the acceptance of it's going to happen. It's not a, oh, you are going to have a child this season and then just be the mother from now on. Mm -hmm. This is the concept of, oh, one day, many years in the future, you will be a mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But right now we're fighting evil by moonlight. So we're not going to do that at the moment, Mm -mm. Um, which is great. So instead, what we get for Usagi coming to terms with the idea of motherhood is that when they're having, um, towards the end, they're having the showdown with, uh, with the evil villains, Usagi is able to tap into Neo Queen Serenity's power. So Neo Queen Serenity sort of kind of like projects her power, like, you know, Dragon Ball Z style, lend me your power, right? Um, Over to Usagi. And um, she's able to kind of like channel that and be a more mature, more powerful version of herself. 
and utilize the power of both the past and present legendary silver crystals without making them touch and destroying the world. <laughs> An important part of any sort of being a hero. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I think by the end, you know, it's it's really nice to see Usagi uh, struggle with the feelings of jealousy and inadequacy and all of these things. And, uh, and then by the end, she's like, okay, you know what? Someday... I am going to be ready for that. And I know that's not today, but I'm not scared of it anymore. It's really nice to see. I think it's, it's kind of like that acceptance of growing up. So in the first, that acceptance arc in the first one, uh, she had to accept the fact that she was this princess all along, right? Like she spent so much of the first season trying to find princess serenity that all of a sudden she was like oh i am and there was a little bit of like for lack of a better word imposter syndrome that went along yes. with it the lack of belief of it the can i really do this and then everyone around her supported her and she be believed it that also exists in this season of like the animosity between usagi and chibiusa uh that existed and the like the lack of mothering the lack of a mothering instinct at all and then realizing that like oh this is my daughter I'm not sure I like it I don't really <laughs> like her <laughs> this could be an issue uh and then eventually getting to the acceptance of like okay this this will be it someday mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I don't need to change my relationship with excuse me, with Chibiusa now, because she's not my daughter. Mm -hmm. She will be my daughter one day. She's not now. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, and that's, that's a fun little, it, it's an interesting take on the acceptance of motherhood. Mm -hmm. Yes, it definitely is. Um, and, and because we've got so much fun, like time travel and powers and things like that going on in Sailor Moon, they can do those fun things and they don't actually have to have their character um, get pregnant and have a baby and then uh, motherhood be their entire plot for the next several seasons. Um, you know? <laughs> like, don't get me wrong. Love it. Can be well written and well done. If that is the intention. Yeah. If you started a show with that and then was like, hey, we're going to get there eventually. Yeah. Uh, or we've run out of the ideas, so let's just make knock someone up. That's when you're like, man, this sucks. And I hate this. <laughs> so I'll give you an example. And this is back to the Vampire Diaries. Um, it's kind of annoying whenever in the Vampire Diaries, they all of a sudden made Haley pregnant and Klaus was going to have a kid because it was like the show is not about that. The show is about sexy vampires and sexy high schoolers getting together and um, and, and feed, defeating supernatural shenanigans while they all have sexy parties, right? So what that means is when they decided to do that, they had to make a whole spinoff show that was actually about family as a central theme. And therefore, having a baby made a lot of sense for that show. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what, uh, when we're talking about the difference here, I know that's kind of the, the take that I'm from, like, uh, pregnancy and babies and, um, and motherhood and things in a show that is about family, I think is great. I love the originals, but when it's in a show about high schoolers, you know, fighting monsters, I, I don't know, like, does it really, you know, sometimes it's a little bit like, why? It, it also... I think that when motherhood is done as a theme in shows that are mostly written and directed and run by men, which Julie Fleck uh, did, like she was definitely part of the Vampire Diaries, but uh, certainly there were other showrunners involved who were male and a majority of the writers in the writer's room were. You have a different way of telling the story of what motherhood is. Uh, and what motherhood seems to be on a surface level. So when you have a show that's directed towards women being told by men how to be a mother or what motherhood is, it's very different than in a show like this, whereas the, the original writer wrote this arc as a woman talking about motherhood. There is mm -hmm. an inherent difference there. Uh, and women can read that in media. Whether or not we like know for sure 
that is a man running it, you can definitely tell whenever you're trying to be critical of a piece of work that you're like, ah, oh, man, yeah, of course, of course, they just like straight up knocked up this werewolf or of course they just straight up knocked up this vampire because how else are we going to do it? <laughs> because Sailor Moon isn't really about um, yes. the explicit nature of uh, of motherhood and of, of pregnancy. It's really about the symbolic nature of motherhood. And, and so it has a lot more freedom. Yeah. And it's, it's also a like the acceptance of if this is what you want. Mm -hmm. um versus yeah it's it's this is not the point of it however it is a concept and a part of her character yeah like there there is something there that is extremely important to know to for osagi that she is going to be a mom one day she's not Mm -hmm. now she doesn't need to treat chibiusa like she's her mom but she is going to be uh and because we play with future and past uh, it's always an interesting concept of like, how does that change a character? Yeah, for sure. For sure. So yeah, motherhood, big theme. Um, big theme. And one of the times that I really, truly enjoyed that theme because it was able to tackle it at a symbolic level, which you don't get to yeah. see a lot of. It's very nice. Another theme kind of in reference to uh, is loss. Law- where we had like, everybody is sad because of melancholy and isolation in last last uh episode and last season we have loss as a huge theme prevalent to almost every single character in this one Mm -hmm. i mean it starts out as chibiusa comes to the past because she needs to find the legendary silver crystal because the legendary silver crystal from her time is gone. So in her mind, she's thinking, well, I'll just go into the past when I know Sailor Moon possessed the legendary silver crystal and I'll get it from her and I'll bring it back to the future and then we'll solve all of our problems, right? So like it literally, the inciting incident is about loss. And then it keeps going from there. Like as soon as everything starts and and we meet our villains for this season, they immediately start kidnapping the Sailor Guardians. So Usagi, one by one, loses all of her friends. Mm-hmm. And then we get to um, we get to uh, them going into the into the future to go kind of you know do what they need to do. And uh, and when Usagi is kidnapped, she ends up saving her friends. But by the time she's done with that, oh no, she's lost Mamoru and Chibiusa. Right? It's just like over and over and over and over well and it's also like to also expand on that you also talked earlier about how when when the girls were getting kidnapped they were experiencing like a the villain questioning what it is that they were good at um and like that's a loss if like they were facing down a loss of pride a loss of Mm -hmm. their identity as well so not only was usagi feeling all of this loss but as the girls were being taken and kidnapped they were also feeling this experience of this is part of my identity, part of who I am, and now I will, I have lost it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have that on top of it. <laughs> yep. So where we had mind control as a huge uh, fear that women tend to feel in the first season, in the second season, what we have in the place of mind control is loss. It's, um, you know, am I, am I going to lose what makes me special? Am I going to lose the people close to me? Um, am I going to lose my power? Um, so we don't have, we don't have as much mind control. I mean, there's still a little bit of mind control because it's Sailor Moon. Okay. Like we still got a little bit of mind control. Um, wise man kind of tricks Chibiusa into becoming black lady. She's not really mind control, but he kind of tricks her into it. And then uh, they definitely mind control Mamoru so he can be evil again. Because we have to, okay? Like, we have to mind control Mamoru. (laughs) We have to. It's not Sailor Um, Moon if that's not happening. Especially Um, (laughs) especially after a season of Usagi being terrified that she's going to lose Mamoru to to Chibiusa. Gotta, Gotta add that in there. Yeah, she li- and then she literally does, right? Like yes. she literally does. Um, poor thing. So, so, so this season, it's it's that fear, and I think that we can all relate to that because it's not just losing the people around us or physical things, because the whole undercurrent of this is loss of innocence. Yeah. Usagi finds out that she's going to be a mom someday, so she can know 
longer stay a child. She must someday grow up. And now she knows that that is an inevitability for her. Chibiusa, she loses her innocence whenever she becomes Black Lady and finally gets powers and finally starts growing again. Um, But she starts out with loss. The whole reason that she cares about the fact that they lost the legendary silver crystal is because she lost her mom. Her mom gets trapped in crystal um, and uh, and can't be woken up. So Chibiusa is like all by herself. It's basically her and um, and her cat Diana um, because of the loss of her mother. So everyone loses. It's that like, and that's a universal universal feeling. And I think that there are two significant kinds of losses. There's like the loss that comes with grief and the loss that results in the need to hold on in the Mm -hmm. need to protect. Right. Um, So you have the grief kind of losses, which comes with uh, the, with uh, Chibiusu feeling the loss of her mom with feeling the loss of this legendary silver crystal. Although that could be argued that that's the second kind Uh, you have, uh, you have um, Usagi feeling the loss of grief when she loses all her friends and then she loses Mamoru and, uh, and, and Chibiusa. And then you have the loss that like requires people to just grip on and do desperate things to continue to have, to not lose anything else. And that's kind of what like Chibiusa goes through a lot. She goes through both, but in the, in the coming to be black lady, she has a desperation to hold on to what little she has left. And that loss of like, that loss of not wanting to lose anything means that she loses everything. Yep, yep. She does, Um, and then she has to claw her way back. Yeah, and it's not, there's like a lack of, there's a lack of grief with it. Because a lot of, some of this loss is necessary. Jibusa held on to her innocence for so long that she stopped aging. That she stopped wanting to grow up. Uh, and then all of a sudden she had to. The same thing with Usagi. Usagi has to grow up. That's part of the deal of being a kid. So some of these losses had to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, which makes it tragic and sad. But had to exist. And then some of these losses were just consequences of actions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like kind of being able to see the whole array is an interesting it's interesting how it's portrayed in the show. Yes. And I think that this is also something where it's like Sailor Moon is still able to keep its universality, even though this particular season is so incredibly uh, feminine with motherhood being a big theme and with it being really about Usagi and Chibusa's relationship. Um, we can all relate to the the pain and the trial of growing up. Uh, Because one of the inevitabilities of growing up is losing those you were close to. It's rare that by the time you're, you know, out of college and working and things like that, that you still keep in touch with your high school friends. You might for a few of them, but um, most people do not. Most people do not keep in touch with the friends that they had as children. Um, and, uh, and if they do, it is very few of them and the contact is very infrequent. We all tend to just go and form new lives, um, with new people and, uh, and new situations and new environments. And that loss is hard. It's really, really hard. And in a season that's all about growing up, I think it is very appropriate that we back off of the mind control just a little bit and focus a little bit more on the feeling of loss and the way that it connects to uh, to growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that like, as a young woman, that, I mean, I think as a person, it's universal, like you were saying, and it keeps its universality. But as a woman, so many times in which our growing up is not within our control, that we don't get the choice of that loss that we, that it is either taken from us or we're put in a position where we have to, whether it be being the oldest sibling, all of a sudden having to take care of children or whether it be some other terrible thing. Uh, That lack of choice is really reflected in this show. And it's another way that it shows the show doesn't hold any punches to young Mm -mm. girls. Nope. It treats its audience as where it's at and as it is. And you will, if you don't get it, 
you will eventually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. And that's something very beautiful about it. Tragic, but beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. I just love Sailor Moon. My gosh. So good. (laughs) So good. It's so good. (laughs) If you have not watched it or if you have not rewatched it as an adult, again, you just you just have to go experience it. And if you can't handle the first season because the animation's garbage, I understand. But you can start with this season. You remember enough. I promise you can skip the first season and just start with season two and you'll be fine. You just need to listen to the VOD. Or you just need to know that uh, Sailor that Usagi makes friends and they fight bad people. Yep. <laughs> and that they're aliens from the moon. Yes. <laughs> oh, I thought Lady no. was going to come say hi. She was eating her hi, food, lady. but she just uh, she jumped the other way. Oh, yeah, I okay. guess not. I guess she no, wanted lady. to go somewhere else. All right. Shall we talk? Because we kind of skirted around this one, but shall we talk about innocence? Yes, let's talk about innocence. So, oh. um,. Yep. So we stay on the slide. Oh, that was part of it. Sorry. Yep. Um, So, so yes. So when it comes to this particular season, you get the strong feeling that uh, by the end of the season, everyone is really grown up. Um, And, uh, and it comes directly from the Usagi and Chibiusa relationship and what those Mm -hmm. characters have gone through. But you get the sense that it's happened to everybody. And this is further cemented with like, um, at the beginning of the next season, they start talking about what it's going to mean to enter high school and do high school exams, right? So this is definitely, this season is like the end of a little era for the girls. And um, and uh, and they really, they cannot be children anymore. Their enemies are getting stronger and their enemies are getting more deadly and, uh, and hitting them in places that really, truly hurt. Um, it's not just about saving the world. It's also about um, being better people and stronger people. Yeah, Um, and that about being better and stronger. And I think that especially for Usagi, because she's accepted, she's accepted this level of motherhood. I think that also means that she's kind of accepted the fact that she, that while the Sailor Scouts exist to take care of her, she is in a position to kind of look at them as the people she needs to take care of, which is one step closer to like getting her to the idea of being Queen Serenity Mm -hmm. Uh, is that Mm -hmm. she is, she is stepping into that queenly role in a way that she didn't before. Uh, And I think that honestly has to do with her relationship with Usagi or with Usagi, with Chibiusa and acceptance of motherhood and her loss of like realizing that she can no longer be a child uh, and realizing where she can grow to. It's a weird thing to be able to see the person who you're going to be in a thousand years. Uh, that, that's that got to fuck with you in some <laughs> aspect. And I think that because it's magical and wonderful and, and it's not, it, it doesn't want to take itself too seriously. How it does that is it shapes all the relationships that Usagi is going to have from now on mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and who she's going to be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it makes me very, very excited. It, it definitely, uh, when this was coming out, like actually, um, when it was coming out, I remember when the season ended, I was like, no, I want the next season. <laughs> the good news is the new season's on, on Hulu or Netflix. <laughs> yes, it is. So you can go watch it right now. You don't have to wait like There's I did. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, there, there is. <laughs> so yeah, for sure. No, and I think, I think it's, it's awesome. And I also think that it moves the step in the relationship she has with Mamoru. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. is that all of a sudden she like gets it the jealousy is a little less with Usa, with uh Chibi Usa and Usa and Mamoru's relationship and yeah. that is because this maturity has allowed her to grow yes um for sure. It, it's it's kind of like uh, in the next season, whenever there's these little jealous moments between Usagi and Chibiusa, it's, like, it's more like a joke. Like, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, this is the bit that we do. Ha 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 ha. Yes. Like, it's not serious anymore. And, and I think everyone has kind of had that that relationship of like, hey, this started out this way. Then as I got to know this person or something like that, we keep it up for all time's sake. Exactly. We just, it, <laughs> like, for, it's, for me, it's not even a relationship. For me, it's just like, I formed an opinion 
within 10 seconds of hearing something and now i'm gonna die on that hill forever even if it gets to the point of ridiculousness in which i am making it abundantly clear that i don't believe in this thing i'm gonna continue with this bit yes. uh, and that's kind of their relationship from there on out yes for sure um which is nice so i think at this point we can um we can ask the ultimate question so landon does sailor moon crystal season two resonate of course of course it does it resonates uh from all of the themes uh to how it treats its audience without with the appropriate kids loves that it tackles real things that real women go through in a fantasy fictional way uh that can connect and interest the audience while also making someone not feel alone uh, yes. That 100 percent resonated as a young girl. It resonates now as a young woman who's experienced some of these things that the themes that have exist existed. Um, it absolutely resonates. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, this season resonates even more than the first one. In my I opinion. love that. Yeah. What about you, Karen? Did it resonate for you? Oh, yes. And I totally agree. Um, as a kid, this is my least favorite arc of um, the anime. I liked the beginning of the anime. And then I would kind of be like, oh, my God, when they introduced Chibiusa, this is so annoying. This is so annoying. And then finally, when they get to the next part where they introduce the outer senshi, then I'm like back on board. Right. But as an adult, mm -hmm. totally opposite. This this arc and the storytelling That's that happens in this season so much better. It's so much better and it resonates so much more. And uh, than it did when I was a kid watching it. I think it, at that time I was just too close. I was too close to the subject matter. Um, and now I can kind of look back at it and be like, oh, I understand now. I mean, I went through certain things. My friends went through certain things. Like, it's kind of like, I'm like, ah, I get it. <laughs> it and I think it's rare to find a show that does this. Mm -hmm. where uh, it makes, where it is directed towards a certain age group, but makes more sense when you're older. Yes. Um, and like, cause like, it, I think this is almost what keeps it as a child show. Yeah. Cause there is that same thing that exists. in when I'm talking like children's show, I'm talking like really little children's show where like, as you look at it as a parent, and you watch things as a parent, you're like, fuck, they're speaking to me. I yeah. understand that so much more than I did when I was six, seven, eight. Yep. Um, yep. And and Sailor Moon keeps that, even though the audience is older. Yep. Absolutely. And I'm not sure how many other shows do, how many other shows really do that. Yeah. No, I would um, agree. And, and yeah, it, or, at least how many shows back when this was original do that? I feel like it's much more common to do that in cartoons now, um, but certainly not cartoons necessarily or shows directed towards women. Yeah, exactly. I think that's a big difference. That's a big difference there. Yep. So um, we went a little fast today, but I have an extra fun bonus thing we can do that I didn't, I, I, I have this in my back pocket. Okay. Landon doesn't know. Landon, I'm going to send you a link through the Zoom chat. Oh God. Okay. Um, so go ahead and, uh, and it's a video. So I don't know okay. if you need to change your screen sharing so that the audio will, will play. Um, but we're going to watch this. Go ahead and pause it for now. I'll introduce it. Yep. Um, we're going to watch this. This is the recently uncovered Saban Moon pilot episode. For those that do not know, there was at one point in time potentially going to be a um, Sailor Moon live action remake instead of dubbing over the anime. And guess what? Ray Mona found it. It was in the Library of Congress. She finally got permission. And I would love to see Landon's reaction to the Saban Moon episode. It's only 10 minutes. So I would love for us to watch it. And by the way, um, YouTube audience, if uh, if I get like a flag for this, because of course I didn't get proper permission, Ray Mona did, not me. So this might get cut. So I'm so sorry if there's an awkward cut here um, for you YouTube people. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so before we end, it's only 10 minutes. Let's watch it together, Landon. I should, it should have audio. Okay, well play play it real quick. And I want to, if I don't hear anything, I'll say something. 
Can you hear anything? There's, there's no audio yet, is there? Yeah, it just started. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's not that. It's yeah. Pause it. Can you pause it really quick? Yeah, it's paused. Okay. Okay. So it's your. Um, it's going to be your Zoom settings. So if you go into the screen sharing in Zoom, it's there's going to be a checkbox at the bottom that says to also share your audio. I bet that is not marked. My screen sharings. Yeah. <laughs> If you can't figure out how to get to them, you can stop screen sharing and you'll oh, just look on. wonky for a bit. And then you can start screen sharing again and you'll see the, the settings. But that's not necessary. You can get into it without doing that. I need to something in order to do that, it says. Wait, how did you... Sh really? You have to install something. Yeah, hold on. Maybe that did okay. it. Okay. Like to do the sound? Oh, yeah. it worked. Yes. Okay, okay. cool. All right, yeah, you guys. I needed to do something all right okay oh that was fast okay here we go you guys let's watch saban moon once upon another time once upon another place our solar system was besieged Wicked Queen Beryl and her evil forces of darkness captured the outer planet and seized their jewels of power. The princess warriors ruled Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and the Earth's moon. To become absolute ruler, Queen Beryl must defeat the princess warriors and obtain princess the remaining warriors. cosmic jewels of power. <laughs> I love exposition. The it's royal the best. families of the five inner planets, led by beautiful Queen Serenity, formed an alliance to defeat Queen Beryl, making the moon their capital. It's amazing how you can just do an entire season in three sentences. Queen Serenity announced the betrothal of her only daughter, Sailor Moon, to Darian. Prince of the Earth. A great celebration was held on the moon to honor the momentous occasion. Sailor Moon was surrounded by her closest friends, the Princess Warren. <laughs> Sailor Mars. Remember, Sailor this is a pilot with awesome. very cheap animation. <laughs> Sailor Jupiter. Ah, hey, uh, we got a black Sailor Jupiter. Jupiter. Yes, we do. Also, Sailor Mercury has a wheelchair. Darren the redhead placed a star pendant around Sailor Moon's neck and presented her star with pendant. a single rose. A symbol of my rose. everlasting love. A chilling breeze swept the rose from his hand. <laughs> it's Beryl. <gasps> it's Beryl. Beryl. just found us. Our time is finally at hand. Now the darkness shall have dominion. The solar system is mine. Behold, Queen Beryl. She's blue. <laughs> I love her makeup, though. <laughs> right? We must stop them. He's so ugly. His voice is really weird. Also, I miss her hair. Yeah. It's a cat. But don't worry. Even in this version, Sailor Moon has to come and save Tuxedo Mask. <laughs> It's up to you to pilot the galleon. I can't leave you now. There's no time to argue. You must save as many as you can. Quickly, take the jewels. You and the other princesses must escape with Darien to Earth. But there's no time to explain. You princesses now possess the most powerful pendants in the universe. Guard them with your lives. Escape into the vortex. There you can hide in a different dimension. Beryl cannot follow. I will find a way to communicate with you. Be Luna? But you must yeah. leave now. What? Did they whitewash Luna? Yeah. <laughs> they made Luna yeah. white and fluffy instead of black and sleek. Yeah. I don't know why. <laughs> I guess they thought that was, like, more popular for American kids. I don't know. We must reach the galleon before it's too late. Watch out! Look out! No! I love no! that explosion. It's so dramatic. Also the tears. Oh my god. We almost have them. Faster! Faster! I love I know it's a dress, but I just like the idea of a bicycle. Right here. Oh my god. Jesus. 
Okay, here we go. The live action part. Oh, Luna. Home seems so far away now. Hey, Vic. Vicky. Victoria. Victoria. Can I borrow your lipstick? What? Sure. Where are you going? Don't tell me you forgot. Whoa! There goes one of my nine lives. The tan! She looks like an angel flying higher than a bird. <laughs> sailor, sailor moon. She's That's how I get ready for the dance sky in my boarding school. Another the dance! Sailor, sailor moon. What is this? Should I be smashing a white? The best thing that never happened. Black? What happened to pretty and Also, she's so, so pretty. Luna gives her advice. This bitch just got in the middle of everybody else. She would have been the least favorite. <laughs> Look at these amazing dancers. Also, who is sleeping on the bottom bunk? That's such a low, unsafe bottom bunk. I have no idea. Speaking, I am going to find the cutest guy at the dance. I know you are. And why not? Because he'll be dancing with me. <laughs> love, love a group of lesbians. all that she be. I love this song. She's gonna stop evil forces and save the galaxy. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> I have absolutely nothing to worry about. She and her four princess spider friends are gonna crush crime time and again. Sailor Fox. Sailor Moon. Wrong. Queen Beryl is attacking the people of planet Jupiter. They need your help. No, I can't. Oh my god. She's got to transform Sailor into Jupiter. a cartoon. Sailor Mercury. They did leave us dirty. She has the worst color palette in this one, just like the original. To do battle with Queen Beryl's dark forces. So, this is what I missed the dance for? You guys are in for it. And if I break a nail, you're really in for it. I... Why don't we have a party right here? I... It sounds good to me, but I think these guys are too out of shape to dance. Why don't we burn off a few pounds? <laughs> a little high voltage, boys. Gang way for the original party girl. Oh, I like your The original party girl? Mercury? <laughs> what? Uh oh. Mm. This creep is mine. Take that, tall, dark, and gruesome. Watch out! Are you all right? Hey, somebody answer that phone. This Is Keto Max going to come in? <laughs> oh. Oh. Hurt. My poor Victoria. Oh How my did you god. Know? Oh, <laughs> I hate this. Who can it be? Oh my god! <laughs> The fact that it's a white rose is very nice. Just starts dancing? No, she's transforming. Oh. She's, she's gonna do her. Yeah, see? The moon tiara. Yeah, that makes more sense. I was like, what the heck's happening? The moon tiara magic. It's fading. Look. He's gone. I wonder who he was. I wonder. What other man do we know? I just don't know. Vicky. I just don't know. <laughs> Where are you daydreaming this time, Victoria? Outer space. Jupiter. No, Miss Scrum. I'm right here. I hate that. 
<laughs> it's the direct to camera staring into my soul. That's it. Okay. It. Okay. So I just want you to imagine that coming out instead of Sailor Moon, but like it actually had a budget and a plot and stuff. Because remember, this was just a proof of concept pilot to see if um, if the network was interested. The network wasn't interested. Obviously, what happened in reality was that they um, they released a, a very edited dub of Sailor Moon. Um, but I wanted to I wanted to you to see that and experience it and uh, and give me your initial thoughts. Remember, it's a pilot, and they Hi. did not have the money to do what they wanted to do. Here's the thing. A plus for diversity. Wheelchair, uh, two girls of color in the group. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Loved it. Uh, I think the fact that they made every single girl have the same personality was a little tough because that's something I love about Sailor Moon is that they're all different <laughs> and they weren't in this 10 minute little clip that we got they were literally the same person mm -hmm. with the same acting style um this would not have done well <laughs> <laughs> well they didn't this pick not it up have done well at all they didn't pick it up but remember at this time anime wasn't coming over to the u.s what had come over to the u.s from japan was power rangers so they thought they were making something power rangers-esque that's why it's got like the live action and the animation on there so like imagine this world where the network would have picked this up because i think if the network picked this up and it had a budget like it still would have been like girls fighting and so it still would have been popular just maybe with a younger crowd and imagine what that would have done to other anime coming over it's just this crazy oh, other world yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, if anime didn't come over with Sailor Moon, I think anime wouldn't have had as long of a staying power. I yeah. think it still would have existed and it would have come over. But where, I mean, I, I know that it's mostly men who are like weebs these days still. Um, and, and there was a huge culture in the, in the 90s and early 2000s. But I think that Sailor Moon really opened up a lot of fans. Mm -hmm to watching different kinds of anime and then uh that just allowed more anime to come over yeah and imagine like if this had actually gotten picked up and popular would they have done dragon ball z a similar treatment instead of just bringing it over as a dub wouldn't that have well they absolutely they absolutely would have yes um I, in fact i'm shocked that they didn't do dragon ball z just because <laughs> that would be that would have been in line like this feels like a bigger this feels like a bigger risk yes it would have been it would have been power rangers but man, it's so much cheaper to just bring something over that you don't have to cough up any money for other than the rights yeah. than to make an entire show that you're not sure will resonate to girls because you're not marketing to girls anyway. Yeah, well, ultimately, I, obviously, that's what they did. Obviously, it's it's just, didn't, it, it didn't work. But yeah, they made a heavily edited dub instead. And I'm sure the reason is because that is way cheaper than a remake. Way cheaper. <laughs> so, but yeah, man, that, that was... Since we had extra time. Thank you so much. <laughs> I That was beautiful. That was beautiful. <laughs> it's an experience. You felt all the emotions. It's like as you were watching it, right? I know I, I just, did. <laughs> I felt all the emotions. Uh, mostly thankful that this is not what it was because I couldn't have watched this. <laughs> like if, if you old. were like, if you were like, <laughs> if you were like, no, here, Landon, what we're going to do is that we're going to do Sailor Moon. Uh, here is this live action slash cartoon version of this <laughs> show that is really popular amongst girls love to watch have you watch it i'd get i'd get i'd get that far in and i'd be like karen i can't do this so guys please we can don't never make do, me do this we can never do who frame roger rabbit or <laughs> no i oh no i can do who frame i haven't seen it but i'd be okay with doing that uh, oh. and it's, a, it's a movie though not a tv show <laughs> that's true that's true oh my gosh thank you so much for the follow we do anonymous follows here in case you're somebody that just likes to lurk and not talk you do not have to but please speak up in the chat if you would like me to thank you by name um but i really appreciate the follow thank you so much all right so um so thank you for watching that with me landon uh youtube people welcome back if i had to cut that out because youtube didn't like me posting that segment i'm gonna come back at this point, so what you missed is Landon's reaction to Saban Moon, and um, that's why you have to come to the live show. Hopefully, I got to keep it in, and this is just this really awkward segment it's instead. It. It um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I had a um, Loved it. This uh, this this is our Sailor Moon Crystal season two episode. 
Um, we're going to be doing season three for sure. It's going to be a little bit until we get to it. So let's talk about what's coming up next. Um, so next week on uh, Interstage Window, we are taking just a little bit of a break. Landon is a little bit busy. So we're going to be playing some more of our Sims 2 Legacy. Landon, remember, is elderly. She has uh, a sugar mama and they are adopting. I thought, I thought you were yeah. talking about me and I got very, I was like, Karen, you're older than I am. You can't <laughs> talk about me this I'm going on vacation. I'm not going to pasture. What are you doing? <laughs> but we have to see if your child, Lily, no, is going to no, go no. to college Sims, too. I got you. There just wasn't enough pause to talk about which Landon we were talking about. We're talking about Sim Landon, Sim yes, Landon. I like to be confusing you. with it because I think that's hilarious. It's it so funny. I was, at first I was just like, just I'm just going on vacation. I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> what does she think I'm someday, doing? <laughs> someday, honey, I have I have hopes for you that you can be you know big and successful and uh, and have a little sugar baby. Um, you One know, day that'd be nice. <laughs> that would be yes. You know who would be my sugar baby? Myself. Because I true. deserve nice, I deserve nice things. Someone buy me something. <laughs> Anime girl, super kawaii. I absolutely love your name. Oh my god, it is so 2002 internet, which is like my vibe. Um, oh, yeah. Yes, Sailor Moon Cosmos is coming up summer 2023. Uh, we're gonna be there. You should be there too. Um, I'm very, very excited for It'll be very that. Fun. Yes. Um, so, okay. So on next episode of Artistic License, that is my Thursday stream, which is 6.30 to 8.30 Eastern. Um, we're going to be finishing up Riven. So we've been playing uh, Riven, the sequel to Miss, for the past two episodes. Uh, we've got about 30, 40-ish minutes left of the game. We're going to play that. And then we're going to go back and do some of the more um, more optional bosses on Final Fantasy X. We're at the original creations now. So that's what you can expect um, next time on artistic license also you can find all of my vods on my youtube channel so if you ever miss an episode and you want to go catch up you can go do that i highly recommend it um especially for interstage window because it is podcast style so you can go watch that on youtube um, if you want to make sure that you're getting all of the correct notifications for me, I would highly recommend joining my Discord and getting notifications for there because you cannot trust Twitch and YouTube to actually give you all your notifications, but I control the ones on Discord so you can trust those. My main social media is Twitter. If you ever want to make sure that you're keeping up with what I'm doing, getting all the latest updates, you want to be following my Twitter. If there's ever anything that changes with my schedule or things like that, that is the first place that it goes. So that's all the places that you can find me. Landon, where can everybody find you? You can find me mostly on uh land in maine on instagram sometimes on twitter uh what i'm going to ask for most and first is uh if you do happen to follow me and you are a supporter of the show i would really appreciate it school starts on monday for me and my classroom is not ready i take pride in having a diverse library and having a alternative sitting seating area for my kiddos so i am uh, linked on both my twitter and my instagram is my Amazon wish list for this year's classroom. I would really appreciate if you are able and can, if you could donate. Uh, if not, no problem. I am here to entertain either way, but that is just one little shout out that I like to give. Is it the same as your standard wish list that you have, Landon, or is it is it your classroom stuff under a different one? It is under a different one. Okay, let me go find it. You said it's on your Twitter? Yeah, I'll just DM it to you right now. Yeah, but I, I'd have to get it on my phone. Oh, never mind. Um, okay. Oh, it's not on your Twitter, is it? No, but it's, it's okay. I will I will put it on there here in a couple of bit. But com. it's okay if it's not linked. I'm seeing if it's if it I can find it on your Instagram. So that the peeps can help out the kiddos. I found it. That might be I think it's book. um it's your book. Okay. Anyway, you can buy Landon's book. Yes. That'll help out the kiddos you can buy, too by you can giving buy her my money. book. I'm updating the stuff now. I just wanted there to let go. that exist. Please and thank you. Yes, for sure. Okay. Um, so so that's it. That's it for our episode this week. I'm going to just go back to uh, the... Uh, there we go. Back to the webcam only. Okay. This name means that I'm interested in anime girls. Well, lucky for you, I am an anime cat girl in real life. Um, so I'm really glad that you're here with us. <laughs> So yes, okay. Well, thank you guys so much for watching. Um, this was a really fun episode. So the next time that we are going to talk about Sailor Moon, just to make sure that it's clear, is going to be, it's going to be a couple of weeks. It's going to be on the 17th, okay? So if you want to be here for Sailor Moon Crystal Season 3, you want to be, you want to have like a, a little watch party before, so you can talk about it with us. You want to have it finished by the 17th, 
noon Eastern time. That's when we're going to be going live, talking about Sailor Moon Crystal Season 3. All right. Is that it? Is there anything else we need to say, Landon? I think we're done. I think that's it. I think we're done. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, Let me find someone for us to raid. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see who is live right now on Twitch. Let's see who of our friends are live. Or any of our friends live. Um, Let's see. Oh, Soda's live. We're going to go raid Soda. He's playing Dead by Daylight. Love Soda. Hey, I know you're cool. I know you're cool if you're a fan of Sailor Moon, Anime Girl. Um, we're huge fans of Sailor Moon as well. Landon is not a weeb, by the way. I'm trying. I'm trying to um, help her. Yeah, I'm trying to get her to become a weeb. But she actually was excited to talk about Sailor Moon Crystal because she loved Sailor Moon as a kid. So yes. we're well on our way, you guys. You just need one. You just need a gateway. Landon will be a weeb someday. You'll see. I have a feeling, I have a feeling the other one is going to be Death Note. I think I'm really going to enjoy that one. Yeah, we're going to try that one at some point too. All right, you guys. Thank you so much, of course, for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show here at the theater today. And uh, don't forget, as always, to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. All right. Bye, y'all. See you later. Bye.